stream. All right, I think we're on. Here we are. All right, cool. Let me just minimize that, come back to the Zoom. Beautiful. All right. Cigars and Negronis. Reinhardt's here. Nick's here. Let's uh, let's admit everyone and uh, get this show on the road. Let them in. Let them in. Throw open the doors, dear boy. Who have we got? Japan, Hong Kong. G'day, Darren. How are you? Excellent. Hello. Hey, we have you. We're here, guys. How are you guys? Yes. Birdie's in the house. Hey. Hey, Sam, how are you doing? How are you, mate? It's been a while. Absolutely. Japan. Hey, Naka. Hey, hello. Yes. The gin. The gin. Oh, we all take gin. The best gin in the world. <laughs> Me too. We love it. Bless you. Bless you. Kazakhstan. <laughs> can you see us? We can yeah. see you. We can see you. We can see you. We can see you. I see the face. Oh, can, can you see us? Yeah, Hi. Hi. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everyone. Well, uh, pleasure to see you all. Thank you. Uh, how many? How many Negronis have you mixed, Eric? <laughs> we did a big, a big number for tonight. So we, had, we went through a testing. I was alone with Nicola. Nicola so we did a testing with professional people who are in this industry, uh, and we have an excellent. Excellent Negroni. Oriental uh, yes. cigar gin. Oriental cigar gin. Yeah. I can I, I can show that. I, can, I think it's really like a long prayer. So kiss, yes. <laughs> right, thank you so much. So guys, what kind of integrity? <laughs> We'll wait a, a couple more minutes, see if anybody else wants to jump in, and then we'll, uh, I mean, it's not going to be overly formal. It's a, uh, a night of cocktails and cigars. And Morning. Uh, yeah, good morning, Darren. He's having a breakfast aperitivo right now. <laughs> Joey, where about to you? I'm in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. All right. Well, good morning to you as well, then. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh, 10 yeah. in the morning here. Sorry for <laughs> Celtics this year, yeah, man. It's all right. You know, breakfast is the most important drink of the day. So, <laughs> I agree. wait. So you're so you're telling people stop drinking at a certain time. <laughs> it's, always it's always breakfast somewhere. somewhere. Never mind. So what's everyone' choice to smoke right now? Hey guys. <laughs> 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 well this is this is uh I'll, I'll let you know this is live on facebook so uh you can uh just keep that in the back of your mind before you share any dirty jokes or uh you know, bar stories or anything similar or you know feel, feel like you need to swear on a friday <laughs> Check your attire before anybody, you stand up. Anybody besides Push and I in a lockdown at the moment? Yep, yep. Anyone else? Everyone else is free? Good looking. They were telling me I'm good looking. <laughs> okay, we, we all okay. Yeah. Who's the gentleman in the back left? Oh, the back right, sorry. Smoking right now. Yes. Darren? Yeah. Hey, I'm Darren. No, no, not you. 
Another one. Here, yeah, at uh, the back well, of the I would screen. have talked to you. But the... Different for everyone. Everyone's screen is different. Yeah. So, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> screen with a pink back and a Hawaiian shirt. Oh, that's me. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff from Korea. Uh, not you still. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. shirt. <laughs> you, you touch your nose now. Yeah, you just touch your nose. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. uh, my, uh, my name is Pushpa from Malaysia with Sam, actually. Malaysia. Yeah. Okay, uh, good. Good, good. good. <laughs> that a bloody very. Oh, wait, okay. more people are coming. <laughs> more people are coming. I'll let them in as they come on. Hey. Well, I think I'll... Roll, Make use of the small break to get a backup gin. <laughs> Come here, guys. As we know, as we say. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, pretty cool. Cool. I really like it. So bring, bring the bottle of uh, gin. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> sorry, what time is it? What time is it in America? Uh, 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 East Coast is uh, 10 a.m. It's 10 a.m. for him? Yes. Yeah, some yeah, of them drinking coffee, coffee, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> It's awesome. nine here. I am in New York. Nine a.m. for Darren. And the one, the oh, one on the top, top, right, top right, top right. He's like, he, he came back. Up. He came back with a ball. He came back with a ball. But, wow. All right, let's let's get underway, gents and ladies. Sorry, Katrina. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I was just mentioning to Nick and uh, Reinhard before I let you all in, before I let the masses and open the doors into this lovely Zoom session. It's uh, nothing formal tonight. It's just a celebration of this uh, fantastic uh, cocktail and cigars. And I thought uh, after writing uh, probably one of my uh, better features recently for Cigar Journal, I really enjoyed writing this story. Uh, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed c cigars and Negronis for a long, long time. And I had the chance to write this story for the magazine. But I thought uh, just reading about it's not good enough. I think it's it's better to uh, at least uh, share uh, the Negroni cocktail and a cigar with uh, a group of people, especially in lockdown. I can't even get out to a bar to enjoy one or get to Birdie in Hong Kong or anything. Uh, but uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, and just to kick off, um, everyone's got a Negroni, I'm guessing. Uh, if not, feel free to uh, go and make one or uh, hit up... Uh, Eric and uh, Bertie. Oh, we, we, we got the Negroni. Thank you. But if you, if you don't have a Negroni yet, uh, and we'll discuss this, but if you don't have a Negroni yet and you feel like mixing one right now, you'll need equal parts Campari, red vermouth, and gin. Uh, obviously, Campari is Campari. Yeah, there's an oriental cigar gin we'll ask Nick about as well. Um, so mix one if you uh, haven't already. It's pretty easy to make. But I'm assuming everyone knows uh, how to make a Negroni, and that's why I love them. They're so bloody easy to make. Um, you don't have to remember any uh, special uh, ingredients or any uh, any different amounts of uh, liquid or alcohol. Uh, you don't need any, uh, don't need to blend anything. It's, uh, it's a pretty simple uh, cocktail to make, which is why I love them. But I thought let's, uh, Reinhard uh, was a fantastic resource for the story. Uh, obviously, an ex-bartender is always a good person to include in uh, a story about cocktails. Uh, but I just wanted to ask Reinhard and, uh, about the Negroni. And I think, Reinhard, you might be able to share some information about uh, how different gins and red vermouth can work with a Negroni and cigars. Um, so, yeah, why don't, why don't you start off with, uh, you know, maybe uh, sharing a little bit about your favourite Negroni cocktail and how the, the two other, it's always got to have Campari, but the two other ingredients in the Negroni can affect the taste. Well, let's, let's probably start uh, and go back in time a little bit. Um, when we dig into the, the history of the Negroni, uh, it's, it's actually an iteration of the Americano cocktail, which was a variation of the Milano Torino, um, which gives us an indication as to the geographical origins of the components that would make up a Milano Torino. And that was Campari, and uh, Amaro Cora from, from Turin originally, but it was pretty much um, equal parts of, of a red vermouth and uh, the bitter liqueur Campari that we all came to, to know and love. Um, at some point in history in the early 1900s, a crazy count, uh, Camilo Negroni, 
and then asked for a little more oomph and a little more depth in his Milano Torino uh, or the Americano, which would contain a little bit of soda. And they just said, skip all the water and let's pour some proper gin in there, um, which now we all know and love as equal parts of fabulous gin, which obviously only has to be the Oriental Cigar Gin by the, the, the famous Nick Hammond. A red vermouth, um, preferably um, Pontica, <laughs> or something that has a bit of depth and character and gives you a certain dryness. Because the third element obviously is Campari, where you would get a lot of sweetness um, as well as the bitter notes. And um, Sammy rightfully pointed out it's super easy to make because uh, there's, there's not much fiddling around. You don't need a fancy shaker or mixing glass. You just take your, your standard uh, tumbler, rocks glass, or any other vessel will do. Pour some ice and then equal measures of the three base ingredients. So you could take an egg cup or a shot glass, whatever it is you would like to measure your ingredients with and then fill it to the brim all the time. Now, when it comes to the, the perfect balance of the Negroni, funnily enough, it, there seems to be an equilibrium, um, a, a natural equilibrium of those three components. But obviously, um, Campari being the, the clearly defined standard, it's the gin and the vermouth where the spice of life and, and the variety lies. Because as, as we all know, gin was the booming trend spirit of the last five to 10 years, I would say. And the, the amount of new gins that have flooded the market is just incredible. And so you can get all different variations from your typical London dry style gin with a, with a true juniper forward profile, all the way to a very floral, lighter or fruitier variation of the whole theme. So you can play with that quite a bit. And when it comes to red vermouth, usually it's, it's quite a sweet fortified wine um, that uh, also gives you a little bit of an oxidized Roncio note um, where you would get caramel, you get a little bit of herbaceousness going on. And so this is where, where the magic lies, balancing out the botanical profile and the aromatic profile of the gin with the, the type of vermouth that you're using. And um, obviously Nick will tell us uh, some more about uh, his particular gin, which I just love and think it's a fabulous rendition of the theme. And, and with, with the depth and complexity that it provides, it gives you quite a bit of character and nuance to the, the Negroni as well. One final aspect, and then I'll, I'll stop my rant here, is um, when you pair drinks, and in particular, high-proof alcohols with, with cigars, I'm, to be honest, always a little cautious, because as much as we all love our rums, whiskeys, and cognacs, and they seem to be your standard core when you talk about cigar pairings, the, the, the high ABV, and uh, in particular, the, the woodiness and astringency of matured dark spirits can sometimes be challenging when you pair it with cigars, in particular, a more a meatier, spicier uh, cigar. Let's take a, a full-bodied, peppery, earthy Nicaraguan smoke. When you pair that with a very spicy, astringent, and, and, and long matured spirit, that can be challenging. And the benefit of the Negroni is you bring down the alcoholic level because of the vermouth, because of the melting water when you stir it, and you have a lot of sweetness that counterbalances some of that astringency, bitterness, and, and character. And that's what um, makes the Negroni an interesting pairing. Bitterness is challenging, so be, be cautious and careful with that. But um, variety is the spice of life. And... Uh, Cheers to that and, and to mixing fabulous Negronis with fabulous cigars. Thanks, Reinhard. One, one question, and this came up in my story because I did um, some research at the cabinet here in Kuala Lumpur and the bartender there preferred to make his sort of house Negroni with uh, 30 millilitres of Campari, 
but then he would actually cut down the gin and red vermouth to um, 25 milliliters each. So giving the gin a bit more of an expression. I, I know the classic Negroni is equal parts of those three ingredients, but is there, you know, did you as a bartender play around with uh, the, uh, the, 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 the milliliter count or the, the volume of the other spirits at all? And is that seen as a faux pas or is that seen as, you know, just an expression of the Negroni in terms of finding an ideal balance of, of the three ingredients? In general, I'm everything but a purist. I always say you should enjoy your beverage, your cigar, your pairing, whichever way you like. And who am I to tell you you should do X, Y, and Z? So, so I'm not a big fan of those yeah. religious beliefs <laughs> when it comes to how your drink should be measured, shaped, and stood, whatever. I, I tend to find that when you when you go for a more characterful vermouth like Pantica, where you already have a lot of bitterness and, and hardly any sweetness, I usually tame down the, the Campari quite a bit in order to, to not overdo it with the bitter components. And depending on, on the gin, um, if, it's, if it's a lighter profiled gin, I'd probably boost it uh, up a notch so you get more of it. Uh, whereas if you go for a VGOP from Sipsmith, for example, or another um, <laughs> Navy strength gin, for example, <laughs> go with, a, with much lower measurements, and, and still keep that in balance. I do not see that as a faux pas at all. Um, play around with it, have fun with it, and everybody can find his or her perfect ratio. The other interesting thing that you mentioned uh, for the story was the amount of ice. And how does, I mean, I, I like a lot of ice in my Negroni just to cool things down, but you mentioned that that can also play a role in uh, pairing with different cigars. <laughs> now in general, when you, when you use ice in a drink, you have to consider it's like all the other ingredients. Ice is an ingredient, and in particular, the melting water becomes, in example of the Negroni, it's like the fourth ingredient. And when, when you think about a final cocktail, up to 25% of the overall liquid is melting water. So there you see how important it is for the overall balance and the equilibrium of those ingredients. Now, most people, when they mix drinks at home, tend to use super small ice cubes, something from a tray that they put in their household fridge or freezer. And that's usually a terrible choice because those little ice nuggets will melt almost just by looking at them. And so you, you, you can hardly control the dilution of the drink. And what you want to, to, with ice, you always want to be in control. So better use large chunks, solid, full ice, no holes in there. And if you want an easy solution, just take a large um, topper box or like a plastic container that you fill with water and you put it into your freezer and you always have perfect ice because you can chop it up with a knife or with a spoon afterwards and it will give you large, solid chunks of ice. And then you use that for stirring your Negronis. Because over time, you can slowly see how it, it keeps the drink chilled and you will slowly dilute it down so you can, you can monitor the evolution over time when you get a little bit more of that water going, almost like with an old fashion, for example, where you really want to have that harsh characterful note at the beginning and then over time, you experience how the profile will change with a bit more of the melty water. So consider ice as an ingredient, always get good quality, large chunks of ice and, and make, make it count. One final note here, I'm a huge fan of serving Negronis up. So I try to get a perfect balance by stirring it firsthand to the point where I want it. And then I pour it into an already pre-chilled coupette or martini glass because the Campari is super aromatic. The, um, the vermouth is very aromatic and it's a wine component. And then you have the gin with all those botanical notes. If you serve it up, once the drink warms up and be get, becomes warmer in the glass, it will open up the aroma. So you, it will release much more of those 
delicate aromas and flavors and some more of the winey notes coming through. So in particular, when there's fortified wines involved in drinks, Actually, you have time to warm up in the glass, serve them straight up, and you will experience how the entire profile will change over time. Beautiful. Thanks, Ryan. I've got to say I'm, a, I'm guilty of using the ice trade home, but I'll, I'll take you up on that idea of uh, <laughs> breathing a bit more ice in a larger thing. And just before I move on to Nick to talk about his fantastic uh, Oriental Sagajin, welcome Valerie as well from the USA. You, you're very welcome. <laughs> Hello. Canada, not USA, Canada. Oh, can oh, oh my apology. <laughs> <laughs> we always get overlooked. <laughs> a bit like the New Zealanders as well. We forget about the Kiwis in Australia. It's all right. <laughs> Welcome anyway. Uh, Nick Hammond, uh, now your Oriental Sagajin has uh, received uh, a lot of uh, fantastic raving reviews and is, which is certainly warranted, mate. You've done a fantastic job. Um, tell us, and, and Eric Paras in Hong Kong in the Birdie Cigar Lounge has mixed up Negronis with your gin tonight, which is fantastic, and I'm sure you have as well. What can you tell us a little bit more about your gin? Thank you, Sammy. Lovely to have all of you with me on a Friday afternoon. What a joy, and lovely to see faces and people that I haven't seen or wouldn't be seeing or I can't see because we can't go anywhere. Great to have you all with us at Nakatan. Lovely to see you. It's been a long time. Um, and welcome to all my friends across the other side of the world. What a joy to have you with us. Um, I have to say, Reinhard, genius. Genius. You're absolutely right. The first thing I did was get a dodgy little tray out of my freezer with little silly nuggets, as you said. So I will not do that again. I will get a proper tray and freeze it. That's really good advice. And I must say, you know, I don't come on here um, professing to be an expert on gin because I'm not. So what happened with the Oriental Cigar Gin, which Eric and his friends are enjoying at Bertie's there, uh, what happened with that was, was purely luck, really, in terms of somebody said to me, do you like gin? And I was in a gin distillery. I said, yeah, I like a gin and tonic, like most people do. On a summer's day, I said, but to be honest, I don't drink a lot of gin. I find it doesn't go very well with cigars. And the chap who uh, I was speaking to at the time, who wasn't a cigar smoker, said, um, oh, okay, right, why is that? And I said, well, I've never really thought about it. It just doesn't. So you tend, I think you'll find that's why cigar smokers, and if you, you know, if you mention cigars, you mention whiskey, you mention brandy, you mention almond, yet you mention rum. They're all dark spirits. Um, and I said, I just don't think it works. And he goes, well, I don't like people telling me things don't work. And I said, well, no. And we looked at each other. And of course, the gauntlet was thrown down, you know. And so, and it was the same time that I was launching or trying to find something to launch Leggett's with, um, the brand that I've become involved with. And they wanted to do this collection with me. And we were looking for something really different that hadn't been done before, if possible, or if, if it had a new tweak on it. Um, and that's how it started. And, and it was during lockdown one, as we became, as it became known over here. So that would have been uh, uh, springtime 2020. It seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Uh, and everybody went and locked themselves in like we all have become used to. Um, and it was quite a scary time at first, you know, and I, I think you'll all have experienced this. Um, we've never been through anything like that before in our lifetimes, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And we, you know, every day things were escalating, and it was quite apocalyptic. And um, you know, I've got uh, teenage girls, and they were obviously completely blown away by this, and 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 were asking questions: What's going to happen? What happened? You know, and of course, as a parent. You always try and bluff your way through it. You know, the fact is, you don't have a clue either. So, um, you know, it was all quite a scary time. And I just remember finding solace in dealing with this chat remotely uh, and learning the beauties of Zoom, of course, which we've all done ever since, um, and speaking to him and saying, he's saying, look, I'll send you some samples down. Why don't you try this? I'll do you a basic London dry gin. You tell me what works and tell me what doesn't from your perspective. And, and it was frankly an excuse to sit down, to drink a bit of gin, to smoke a cigar and stop worrying about the state of the universe. Um, 
and we did ping things backwards and forwards and he sent me sample bottles, sample bottles, millions of these little sample bottles lying around my office and that's how it went. And I'd smoke a variety of different cigars. As you know, Sam, I, you know, I, I like most things. And uh, I tried to find something that, you know, just not, wasn't necessarily fantastic because I think that's the mistake a lot of people make is they try and create something that's mind-blowingly amazing and angels sing and the sun comes out. Well, do you know what? That doesn't happen very often. What you really want is like a, just a solid home run with some subtlety to it, some complexity to it, but it doesn't have to leap out the glass and sort of grab you by the throat. Um, and that's how we got closer and closer over various iterations until I said, you know what, that's really close. Have you thought about throwing some of this in? And because I don't come from that sort of background, it's very easy to come up with silly ideas, most of which he said, you know, next to staff, but we'll try it. Or, and he was right most of the time, but occasionally he'd go, do you know what? That has added something amazing. And we were putting in some, the reason it was the Oriental gene is because I said, what if we had some cumin? What if we had some cardamom? What if we had some special X, Y, Z? And he said, okay, we'll try it. And yeah, it really started to bring out the other flavors. Um, and so it became this, this creature. And I can't tell you, how thrilled and proud I am that Eric sitting there with all his pals in the legendary Berties in a place like Hong Kong and you're drinking Nick Ramones with my gin. I'm so chuffed. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. We love, we love this gin here. Cheers, guys. We, we did the... Uh, well done. I, I went through my bottle very, very quickly. Yeah, it goes very quick. And all my friends here love this gin. So... We, we were surprised at, at the beginning. I, I, I'm not a gin drinker, you know, we, we have a bunch of, as you say, it was a trend. We have a bunch of gin on the market, but this gin with the cigar is totally perfect. And it works very well. And with the Negronis, we were talking, uh, Renard mentioned, uh, Renard mentioned about the Negronis. We emphasize, 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 emphasize the, the gin with a little bit less Campari, uh, as you mentioned, and it works perfectly. Do you like it? Yes! I am yes. 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 <laughs> oh, my God. From Hong Kong! Cheers! <laughs> so, or Oriental cigar, cigar gin is one of the best, and I must say I fall in love with the gin right now. Excellent. Thank you, and Thank you Eric. Well done. Last well I'll let you in the secret that um, I texted Eric or I, I messaged him because I just thought, you know, this is a guy who knows what he's on about. I would love to get some opinion. And I said, Eric, uh, nice to meet you. It's Nick Hammond. We've bumped into each other over the years. I've got this gin. I'd love to send you some. And he said, thanks, Nick, but we don't stock gin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of cigars, you know, and I said, ah, and I thought, well, I'm not really going to take no for an answer. So I came back and I said, Fair enough, but this is no ordinary gin. I know I would say this, but I have personally designed it to taste with cigars. And, I, and of course, he's, I can sort of imagine his ears pricking up and Eric thinking, OK, well, maybe we'll try it. And, and the, biggest, um, uh, the biggest obstacle that I've come up against is not the fact that there's millions of gins, because in a way, that's a good thing. You can just try lots of things, and I see that as a bonus, you know. The biggest obstacle I've come up against is people think it's a gimmick. And and because there's lots of odd gin, you know, you can get a nettle gin or a pea gin or anything else you can think of, you know, everything's been tried, some of which are great, some of which aren't, but that's great. That's that's the beauty of life, right? But um, a lot of people think, oh, it's just another novelty gin trying to catch in on the market. And I really think it's better than that. I really do. And I'm so chuffed that you guys enjoy it. And I know, Sam, you know, quite apart from um, being kind about my gin, I know you drink loads of Negroni. You, you love it. I mean, what is it about a Negroni that floats your boat? Uh, good, good question, Nick. And before I get to that, I just also want to say about the Oriental Cigar Gin, not to harp on too much, mate. Don't want to give you too much press. But, <laughs> Bless you all. But I find it's the only gin that you can I can actually drink straight. Yes, you know, yes. yes. 
well enough to be able to have you know meat or on the rocks and it's just divine but i think negroni's uh on my part it, it, kind of weird i mean i just like the fact that it's not necessarily reinhardt might correct me on this not necessarily complementary to a cigar often you know the fact that is actually you know for me it refreshes my palate enlivens the palate in between puffs um, and I know we we got some stick on uh, on social media from uh, a uh, fellow cigar <laughs> writer about mixing Campari with cigars, which is uh, entirely. Yeah. So, may I say something? Sure. I yeah, thought, yeah, that, of course. I thought that his, his comment was out, completely out. Yeah, inappropriate. Inappropriate. He was completely yeah. out. Uh, I did not like this comment. I did not. I, I welcome like all. Uh, <laughs> no problem, Eric. But, but um, you know, Sam, I think you're right. I think what we love about yeah. it is, um, I think what I like about it is, it's like you watch a, say you're watching a movie and there's a good guy, it's generally quite formulaic, but then there's a bad guy who's actually really quite good and you actually like him more. The groanies, you sort of half don't want to <laughs> like it and half love it. And I, I think that's what attracts me to a Negroni. Oh, absolutely. And my wife thinks it thinks it's a, uh, you know, just a poor excuse for mouthwash. So um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's definitely in a quiet taste. But the other reason I enjoy them so much is because they're so bloody easy to make. You don't have to do much pour three liquids into a glass and a bit of yeah. bit of ice, uh, good ice, as we've learned. Uh, and uh, and off you go. And, uh, you know, I, I very rarely this might get me kicked out of my own Zoom, but I, I very rarely cut up an orange because it's just an extra step to do. Uh, yeah. It takes you know, three ingredients to four or five with the ice. But yeah. Darren, yeah. Here, um, I don't know if it looked like you're having a, a conversation on the phone, mate, but Darren's here from Principal Cigars. And he was also featured in my story briefly, but your, his concept at uh, the moment, which I believe is launching soon, is a, a cocktail collection of cigars. We've had cigars for beer, cigars to pair with different whiskies and bourbons, etc. cetera. Um, but I think this is the first time uh, a series will be released that pairs uh, cigars with cocktails. And obviously one in particular is The Count, which is a Lonsdale that will be paired with uh, the Negroni or blended to be paired with the Negroni, which I hard to play a role in. But Darren, I, I'd love for you to jump in and explain a little bit more about the concept and, you know, how you came about this um, pairing of, you know, cigars with cocktails, but obviously with the Negroni in particular. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to uh, blend this whole project with Reinhardt. Uh, it was, uh, and I did what I had a few years ago. I was on a podcast somewhere, and uh, the two guys hosting the podcast were real cocktail nerds. And uh, I just, I was thinking, man, you know, it was a space no one's been playing in. It, it just kind of clicked in my head. And, you know, personally, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm not a fan of pairings, but I, I definitely, I, I look at pairings a little bit differently than most people when it comes to cigars. You know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that cigars are, are very light. You know, you, you have to remember, this is just smoke. And is smoke is not really assaulting the taste buds like a food or a beverage is. When you, when you have a beverage in your mouth, it doesn't matter if it's water or if it's something really strong. It's, it's right there covering your taste buds, you know, giving you all of these sensations. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Pairings when it comes to beverages and food, I believe, are different because they're they're assaulting you at sort of the same level. Where there's just a magical combination of flavors, and you're like, well, they could go beautifully well together. I I find that when you're pairing beverages and cigars, it's a little bit different. I, I think that for one, it's it's more of the experience. Like you're a guy that loves Negronis, so even if, if Negronis, you know, aren't the greatest. Uh, cocktail for cigars, you are going to maybe have your experience where you want it. You love the Negroni, you love the cigar, and you're going to find a way to enjoy both things. And the pairing, in a sense, is are two sensations leading you towards what you know what you want to enjoy and experience. I, I feel like with most beverages, there's there's an amount of time anyway that you have to wait before you can really get what the cigar has to offer. You know, like even if you just take a drink of cold water, if you immediately puff the cigar, you're not getting all that the cigar has to offer at that moment because your taste buds are not ready to receive them. Uh, maybe if you have a beverage and it lingers a little bit as it's fading out, you're in a, in a better position to combine the two flavors and, and to enjoy them. But it's something that you have to be conscious of to really enjoy. And so when I hear people say, oh, this, you know, this doesn't go well with cigars or this does, 
it's all really ridiculous because you can make anything work if if your head's in the right place and your understanding of the fact that you know these these two things are not really designed to hit your palate in in equal ways and so therefore we can enjoy them in some magical way where they're going to have a combined flavor so when it came to cocktails you know i i talked with reinhardt and i sort of had that in mind you know and you know when uh, when i'm enjoying a negroni what about those flavor components as they linger in my mouth what sort of flavors in a, in a cigar are going to go along well with that uh and in the the early parts of the conversation the, the first step was really for us deciding what 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 cocktails were we going to use and we didn't want to use things that were overdone like you know old fashions and stuff like that and the other criteria we had was we really wanted to have cocktails from separate time periods uh, and I, I think we did a good job of breaking that up you know we have a 19th century cocktail which is the, the sazerac then we use the negroni for the you know as reinhardt calls the european era um and then we have a mid-century which we're using the uh the mai tai and uh we we took a little bit of a liberty with the Gibson and we're kind of placing it in the 60s. But even though it has an earlier history, it's when the cocktail was popular. And then for the modern era, we used the espresso martini. And uh, Reinhardt first just gave me his notes on here is here are what we think are the, the flavor notes we want to have for these different cocktails. And then we made the first round of uh, of test blends and just kept tweaking them from there, coming up with not only flavors, but also formats that we thought would go well with the beverages and uh i think we're happy with where we landed on all of the different cigars fantastic and and it's a lonsdale that's uh with you've uh, paired with the negroni is that correct yeah it's a six by 44 i have one here somewhere yeah it's a it's a classic lonsdale for the negroni fantastic any particular tobaccos you're using in the in the the count Lonsdale for the pairing with the Negroni? It's uh, we used Cubra, which is Brazilian for the the wrapper. Uh, we use a really special uh, Dominican binder called we call Monte Plata. Um, and the filler is I think we have two different Dominican tobaccos and one Nicaraguan. But I, I can say that. The people that have smoked all of the cocktail cigars so far, uh, the Sazerac is kind of special because it's a really unusual shape. It's it's uh, we took a, some it's a 19th century cocktail, so we wanted a 19th century cigar. So we took some antique molds, found one that was really nice, and and then reproduced it. So Sazerac is this beautiful, just beautiful. just a really sexy little vitola. Uh, but apart from that. I, I think that the, the we call it the count the Negroni cigar is the standout favorite. I mean, most people are preferring that. It's uh, it's aged really nicely since we make them, since we've made them, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting it out there. Fantastic. And when uh, when do you think uh, getting them out there will will occur? Is it uh, in the near future? Yeah, we keep pushing it back. What we're gonna do is first, I'm, I'm hoping like maybe October we're gonna release. Uh, sampler pack. So the first thing out will be a sampler of five of the different cigars. And then, uh, then one at a time, we'll release the single cigars. So like, if you got it, and you fall in love with my tie, you'll, you'll be able to get a box of that, but we'll do that one at a time. And I think Sazerac is actually the first one, uh, because we went ahead and made more of them. And Negroni will be number two, for sure. Fantastic. Oh, we're looking forward to it. Me too. I, I just want to say when I made my Negroni this morning, I, I had one of these uh, old ice ball things in the freezer and I said, should I use this thing so that these cocktail nerds don't get mad at me? And I'm, yeah. I'm very I have to say, Darren, that is such a brilliant idea. And um, we all have our favorites and we all have little things, cocktails that we like and pairings that we like. And, and you're so right in what you say. You know, if you if you like cigars and you like red wine, then you are going to put red wine and cigars together, whether or not it works. You know, um, and and it works for you, and that is all that matters. And all I would say is, anyone who tries to tell you how to drink or how to smoke needs to go to another room. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not wrong. <laughs> Well said, Nick. Uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, and you know, when, whenever anybody asks me, 
uh, uh, what, what do you what do you pair with your cigar? And you know, I obviously give them a few of the standard responses. If it's, if I've got to drive somewhere to coffee if it's uh, you know in the evening or latter part of the day when I don't have to drive anywhere. It'll be uh, some form of alcoholic beverage. But the main thing for me is that uh, cigars are intensely personal. What uh, the flavors that you pick up may be vastly different from uh, what other people pick up based on their what they've eaten during the day or just their palate and, and what they're used to. So I think the same goes for, for any beverage is the, if it works for you, then do it. Um, I know uh, coffee and, you know, I love a Hoya de Monterey uh, Epi 2 with a, um, a nice tea as well. I mean, you know, that, that sort of hits the spot as well. But I think, you know, there are no rules. And, and part of the fun of cigars is the fact that you can try different pairings. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules. You know, whiskey, rum, bourbon, cognac, brandy, you know, is the traditional, uh, you know, drinks, libations that people usually enjoy. Uh, but, uh, but apart from that, uh, you know, especially, you know, the old guard, I think, is sort of phasing out and we've got all the new guard here joining us this evening. And, and that new guard is definitely, you know, do what you enjoy. You've, you've paid good money for your cigar, so you enjoy it how you like. That's yeah, also absolutely. not to forget that people who's to say we're all tasting things the same? I mean, you know, genetically speaking, there are some people that certain herbs are uh, very harsh to them or certain things they can't taste at all. And you're talking about a cocktail that has a, a very strong herbaceous component to it. So who's to say that Nick doesn't taste it and perceive it completely differently than I do? Exactly. And, and when, you're, when you're at home, not on a live Zoom or not writing an article or trying to pose on Instagram, you get pick up whatever you want to pick up and you have it and you enjoy that and there's no pretense there's no ego there's no um trying to conform or keep up with the joneses and i think that is what cigars is about um if you like a toscano and a cup of tea good on you you know um and he, uh, and if you like to smoke arturo fente and and you know 30 year old scots that's great too as long as you don't go around telling everyone that that's the best there is and that's what everyone should aspire to you know we all like we all like different things. And, and that, to me, is the beauty of what we do. You know, there's, what is there, 15 people on now. Um, we're all individuals. We're joined together by the love of smoke. But how that comes together and how you enjoy it is massively personal. And, and I love to hear how other people enjoy their cigars without, you know, judging them, really, I guess. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with you, You know, here in Bertie, our best uh, soft drink, Coca Zero. <laughs> really? Yeah, apparently he matched perfectly with this cigar. Yeah, no, 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 no. Coca Zero is the best seller uh, as a soft drink. But he refresh, refresh the palate. And we do pretty well with the uh, poor, poor tea, which go very well with the cigar. And Again, to come back to your gene, the oriental cigar gene goes very nicely, uh, neat, with ice, with a big cube of ice. Uh, and that makes a big difference. And it's not every gene that you can enjoy alone. You know, normally you, you go with gin tonic and easy drinks with the gin. But this one is perfect straight. We had that with my friend Glenn. <laughs> on the testing with the Oriental Cigar Gin, and it was straight at uh, 2 p.m. And uh, I said the same like what you said. Uh, it's, it's the first yeah. gin I love to drink straight. Yes. Yeah. And this, I mean, I'm, I'm a gin lover. I, I love gin and soda and uh, gin tonic, whatever it is, right? But gin straight, that was the first time for me, and I, I was wow. And with a yeah. cigar, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I wanted to. I wanted to, I mean, I love, I love scotch and I, I wanted something that had this feel of a soft lowland scotch, you know, that lovely soft, almost rounded feel that you could sip, you know, and not have to mix with stuff because I personally, apart from the Negroni, which is like my kicking the balls on a Friday night, but I like to, I like to taste something small amount and, and have it pure. And then I thought, you know, I've never tasted pure gin, so I tried a few, and it's pretty, pretty hard for a lot of them. They don't taste great because they're so bitter. And I thought, okay, well, how do I approach that? And and so that's what I was aiming for. And and if you, you're right, if you have the the cigar gin very cold and neat, 
you know, it's quite strong, so you can't have too much of it, but a couple of, you know, shots of that is just lovely. No, totally agree. It goes very well with the cigar. And it's not a machine that goes well with the cigar. So maybe after the Negronis, we go neat. <laughs> neat with ice cube. One ice cube. Uh, Eric, you make me feel like I want to be with you in Hong Kong, mate. It's a uh, lockdown over here hasn't been fun. Uh, <laughs> and one thing I would I would like to add, and 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 I can I can only congratulate and and, and thank Nick and, and Darren for all their wonderful comments. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but what what I would love to add is, uh, I think we're we're really stuck to that term pairing and and the idea of having the cigar and then a drink with it. I think what it all really comes down to is creating holistic experiences and every cigar by itself is an experience and uh, that's the beauty of Darren's concept and uh, I consider myself very grateful to, to hopefully have given him a few little inputs here and there. Um, what a wonderful project that, that pays tribute to exactly that idea. It's not just a pairing of a cigar and the beverage to go along with it, but it's an entire experience room that we're creating together with the historical setting. <laughs> texture of what the cigar and the drink and the vessels going to feel like which particular type of music you would probably like to enjoy with that what's the the, the visuals the color it all comes together in our senses and our instruments and only if they play together in the most well conducted way then then, then that's the symphony of, of our perception and I think if, if we can all just integrate that a little more into our everyday life and think about how to perceive more holistically, it's, it's mesmerizing and fascinating. And I would wish that, that, that we encompass that, that idea a little more of taking an experience to the next level. Absolutely, Reinhard. I actually, I actually think that when you do have time for a cigar, you choose your cigar, you go through that ritual of, you know, cutting and lighting, which is, you know, soothing in a way. And I think for me personally, I mean, I do drink other things besides Negronis, uh, but when I do mix that Negroni, I, I feel that experience starting. You know, I usually mix the Negroni first, uh, grab a cigar, but it, it is like the, 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 the starting point of that experience, which I think is, is what we all are after, especially if being through lockdowns, et cetera, um, especially being at home, uh, you want to, you know, enliven your senses as much as possible so that you can escape uh, from uh, your, the, the dreariness of day-to-day -day living, which uh, sometimes has been tough for a lot of us. Um, thanks, everyone, for being a part of it. Now, this is not goodbye. Don't think that's a goodbye. I'm just throwing it open to anyone who wants to jump in with a question or a comment or uh, you want to bag the Negroni, you're more than welcome to join in and uh, ask a question of uh, Darren, Nick and Reinhardt or anyone else. Uh, Gino's joined us as well. And Alex Spencer in, uh, the, in uh, Cincinnati, welcome. He's off screen at the moment, but uh, he's got a fantastic cigar called the Mansa. Uh, so very welcome, Alex. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to the to the uh, to the group. If anyone's got a question or a comment, feel free. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, thank you for joining us. It's been fantastic. But it, this is not the end. Uh, you're welcome to uh, hang around and talk cigars and Negronis and whatever else uh, at your leisure. Well, I do have a question. How can I get my hand on a on a bottle of this, this exactly <laughs> why isn't it in korea yet <laughs> yeah I, mean, well, well, uh, I said earlier that one you know the obstacle was um people thinking it was a, a gimmick the, the second obstacle is something called brexit and the third obstacle is something called international exporting of which i had no experience so um whereabouts <laughs> are you sir well i'm i'm in cincinnati ohio in the united states okay. right so we are working on trying to get some distribution in the US. Um, and uh, you're not the third person to say it. Nick, can, how can I get you to um, And the most frustrating thing as anyone who's created anything or sells anything is to someone say, can I have your product? And you say, no, I can't really get it for you. It's yes. the case of everything. Yeah. No. So we're working on it. Um, feel free to email me at nick at nick uh, mm -hmm. 
www.ghostbusinessclub.com um, and so we're in touch and I will find a way to get some to you and uh, uh, I'd love you to try it and we are you know looking for worldwide distributors we're working with loads of people but it's a slow process unfortunately but um, you know it's you are fortunate Yes, is it possible hey, to, uh, to, I'm sorry to cut you guys off, is it possible to put that on the, uh, on the messenger so I can copy that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we haven't got a chat facility, have we, Sam, here? Uh, I think so, but Alex, I can connect you with Nick, no problem. Okay, okay that'd be great. All good. Thank Valerie, you. I think you had a question. Was it you? No. Joey? Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, when you were making this gin, what kind of cigar did you have in mind with, like, the, for the gin to go well with? Yeah, great question. Um, again, I wanted, I wanted to try and create something that was fairly holistic because... You know, lots of people will tell you you should smoke Cubans. Lots of people tell you I only smoke New World. I'm one of the people who likes everything. So I wanted to try and create something that could be decent. You know, some might be better than others. Um, and in fact, around the bottom of the, around the back of the label, I did put on a few suggested pairings. Which again, which again, I, I was a bit um, reticent to do because, as, as Reinhardt says, you know, once you mention pairings, you're starting to force people into preconceived ideas and things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like Sammy. I love the Epi Two from Cuba. I just think it's a beautiful cigar. It goes well with these things. Um, I like everything from a, from a mild cigar to a ball breaker. Um, so, you know, if you want to have an E2 with it, I, I don't think it's too overpowering. Um, but the Hoya, the Hoya Numero Uno, is a lovely, soft, complex cigar that I think pairs very, very well. Um, some of the more sort of hardcore styles might be a bit harder, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I've never found anything that I've thought, oh, my God, that's awful. So yeah, I would suggest, uh, yeah, enjoy it with what you enjoy and you're much more likely to enjoy both. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out like, what you had in your mind as like an image, because some drinks, they go really good with lighter, lighter uh, strength cigars yeah. and some go better with stronger strength cigars, like Ryan Hargo was mentioning earlier. Yeah. And so I wasn't sure just because, like, the market that I typically experience over here in the U.S. versus internationally is very different, you know, because yes. over here, you know, normally everyone's going for full body. But yeah. from my speculations, it's usually mild to medium internationally. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right, Joey. And, um, and I would say that, you know, because it is relatively subtle and and not a real sort of um, powerful taste, that probably the medium to, the mild to medium spectrum is your best bet. Um, okay. You know, and as you say, with the best will in the world, you know, lots of America does love a, a Drew Estate, you know, real ball breaker cigar. Um, but that's why I might point you towards a Hoya range as somebody who I I've worked with closely in the past, and so I love their cigars, and, and they are slightly more subtle, I guess would be fair. Not, not doesn't mean yeah. they're better or worse, but different. Um, yeah, you, I, think you, I think you're right. I think the sort of mild to medium to medium to full is about as far as you want to go with the, with the cigar, Jim. Okay. So what we did uh, tonight, we did with Oya de Nicaragua and Oya de Monterrey. I took a double Corona Oyo de Monterey, and I have some friends here who took the Oyo de Monterey double Corona. Very nice. Royal Nicaragua. Yeah. Classico. Classico, yeah. Classico fits very well. Yeah. Medium. And now, now we are going through uh, gin alone. Meat. 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 I love it. I do. Meat. <laughs> It makes it's uh, it's good good for my soul to see you enjoying it, gentlemen. I can't wait to come out there and and uh, have an event with you. It's cool. Everyone has a gin meat, Negroni and gin meat, and can go and <laughs> they're going to be wheeling you out of there later. Yes. I, I've got a question for for everyone. How uh, I mean, I I usually you know with 
cigar. It's usually a Negroni. Sometimes it's a rum, sometimes a whiskey. But how often do everyone here who's joined us tonight, how, how often do you have a Negroni? Is this the first time you're tasting a Negroni with a cigar um, for the event or is it something that you do regularly? I'd love to get people's opinion. Push, I see you've got a Negroni, but are you a regular Negroni drinker? No, sir, it's just um, thinking it. I saw your article and so on, so I just grabbed it with cabinet, but uh, it very very well with the pairing of the cigars. I mean, yeah. What do you normally drink, Push? Sorry? What do you normally drink with a cigar? Um, um, scotch. Well, Sam, I, I, for me, I think it would just be very rare that I would do that have a Negroni with a cigar, but we, we had like a, a brief little DM going back and forth when you were just starting to write the article. Like, yeah, let's do some research. And I, as uh, Nick said, I think it just goes perfectly. Like right, right now I have an H. Upman Royal Robusto, which is good, solid, medium, and it is just divine. And, and the interesting thing is like what Reinhardt was talking about having the uh, Negroni just up, I've never done that in my entire life, so I'm doing it now, and it's a fantastic. It, rather, I think when it's on the ice, you get more of the Campari, but just up, I'm getting so much of the uh, of the vermouth, which has got a much deeper, richer flavor. And I, I, I think you've sold me on this. This is fantastic. Which goes back to what Nick was saying. I think with well, I guess everyone is with Darren and Reinhardt. <laughs> Spirits and like cigars are they, also very intimate and personal. That it's whatever you like, the way you like it. And as the the uh, I, I call myself the, the spiritual consultant for the local cigar club, that's just what I say. It's like you can't say do this with this because it doesn't work. It's just something you've got to come into. What's your flavor profile for spirits and for the cigar? What what are you looking for? And then deciding if you want to equate things or if you want to contrast things. And I think it's, it's it's such a fascinating thing that you you right. something we all love and do, and we can all experiment with it. And I'm really super excited for uh, Nick to find a way to get some of his gin here into Korea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll do it. We'll do Jeff, it. tell everyone uh, you're in Korea, Jeff. But tell us a little bit about Casa uh, Habano in in Busan. Tell us a little bit about your uh, your local club. Oh wow, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because we the the founder. Uh, Mike Conforma, he's, he's been like my, he was my best friend for like 16 years. And a, he was a business consultant and an angel investor. And he, he just decided that uh, he's ready to retire. And he said, I'm just going to, I'm going to make a cigar club. I've got enough money that I don't care if anyone walks through the door of this place. I'm happy. I'm just going to make a place I want to be all day long with me and my computer, my drinks and my cigars. And so he created Casa Habano which is exclusively Cuban cigars here in Busan. And uh, it's, it's been a fantastic void, especially with COVID involved. But, uh, it's, it, it was just, he just created, it's got all Cuban colors, the, 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 the oranges, the, the, the blues, the pastels. It's, it's a great place to be and it's very much a, a family atmosphere where people just can come and total strangers can be best friends by the end of the night, which I think is the way a club should be. I'm, I'm not the just sit there, no music, shut up and smoke your cigar and ignore everything around you. So it's got the friendly atmosphere, but uh, Mike uh, passed away a year ago, June 13th. And it, it, it was, it was a devastating loss, but he was in the club doing what he wanted to do, smoking his cigar, preparing for a cigar event later that night. So I think if Mike had to go, you could not create a better scenario for him to go. And we, we still have the cigar he was smoking when he had his heart attack in a display case there. And since then, I mean, I'm just there so much. People think that I'm one of the owners that, that don't know the club. But it's a, it's a I, I, I get the spirits and I handle the spirits and answer all the questions while I'm, I'm there for the people. But it's a great place to be. Anybody ever comes to Korea, you got to come to Busan and, and come to Casa Habana. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for sharing that lovely memory of Mike as well. I never got to meet him. I, I did uh, contact him and yeah. we went back and forth a few times. So cheers, Mike. Uh, this Negroni's for you, mate. Yeah. Um, cheers yeah. to Mike.
Absolutely. Thank oh, you. Yes. Uh, yeah. One question is. Um, <clears throat> In terms of uh, Negroni, to go back to the uh, gentleman with uh, glasses, with a very, very nice background. Reinhardt. Sunny. <laughs> Reinhardt. The one. Reinhardt. Yeah, Reinhardt. The, Just uh, a little bit of is, hair. Uh, there has been, uh, for a few Sometimes. years now, a guy, Giancarlo, who has started a, a brand, Mancino, with vermouth that have been totally for Negroni, totally ne Negroni, spot on on the, having the drinks balanced into the, the cocktail of what, what it should be tasting like. Do you agree in one way or do you think another brand might have taken place otherwise to making the perfect Negroni based on a cigar that we are smoking? Well, first of all, I have to, to apologize. I had to change location and, and I'll be on the run to the uh, to to the train station soon, but uh, thanks for the question. Actually, I know uh, Mancino and the gentleman behind it quite well. He's a dear friend of mine and a, and a fellow manufacturer. Um, in in general, it it really depends. I mean, um, Mancino, like many other vermouths, is a typical Italian red and sweet vermouth. So you, you would get a lot of caramel. You get a lot of sweetness and mellowness. Um, if you go for something a little bolder. Um, with with more bitterness, like the, the Pontica that I mentioned that I'm manufacturing myself, the the intent there was always to bring the the wine quality and the herbaceous quality more to the forefront. But um, that, that that's very much up to to, to personal preference. Um, I, I guess Antica Formula uh, has always been uh, one of the benchmark red vermouths in general, which has a similar profile to Mancino with a lot of richness, depth, complexity, and, and sweetness. Um, so, so those would probably be my, my two recommendations there. Just a quick question for Darren. Was there any particular gin or vermouth that you mixed into your Negronis when you were going through your blending process with the cocktail collection at all? No, I I, uh, I left most of that up to Reinhardt. I mean, I got things in the ballpark, but I'm the wrong guy you want toiling over the minutia of uh, the drink differences. I, uh, I I just want to comment on what you were saying earlier about um, you know having the cocktail up and Jeff. I think how you discovered it it was more enjoyable, and I think that one thing I'm always saying, whatever you're drinking or smoking, like there, there's a bit of operator knowledge that if you put into it, you can definitely increase the experience. And, you know, for us in particular, we make fairly delicate cigars, not delicate flavor wise, but delicate in how they're balanced and, and the optimal way to enjoy them. And just like with cigars, you know, heat is the enemy of flavor. If, if you have a cigar and I have a tendency to heat up cigars because I, I puff a lot. So I, I have to be cognizant of, am I heating this cigar up? Because if I'm doing that, then of course the flavor is going to be going down. And same thing, if you have a cocktail, you know, there's gonna be an optimal temperature and there's, there's nothing wrong with something ice cold, but you're crazy if you think that ice cold beverage on your tongue is gonna to allow you to perceive uh, all of the small differences that you're going to perceive if you have quality ingredients and it's at, you know, a room temperature, let's say, or, or a, a cooler, you know, not, not so cold. Uh, so, so same thing with coffee. Like, have you ever gone into a, a restaurant, you get a cup of coffee and you say, ah, that's not so great. And then as you're, you're eating, you have another few sips and you say, hmm, actually, it's not so bad, this coffee. It's because, you know, it was too hot in the beginning. So it wasn't giving you all the flavor. And then as it cooled down a little bit, you're suddenly able to perceive a lot more. Uh, and it, it's another reason why, I, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm not such a fan of consistency and you know we, we always try to make the best cigars right we our cigars have a tendency to differ from production to production because we are always tweaking things and trying to make them better how can i make the perfect negroni cigar when one guy's got a block of ice one guy's using a really herbal gin one guy's using you know so there are so many different things that go into your experience the, the best we can do is hope to uh hope to find something that's going to work most of the time and then give people a little bit of of um, understanding and knowledge so that they can best steer the experience to, to get out of it what's available. Um, I'd like to follow up on that if you don't mind, Darren, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but <laughs> you basically said, you know, you're looking at the cigars and the cocktails as a historical journey. 
And I remember from your interview with Smooth Draw Cigar Radio that you have quite a background in vintage cigar memorabilia, if I can use that term. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's what got me into cigars. I'm, I'm an antique dealer and uh, I deal in mostly in paper and uh, tobacco advertising and old cigar labels are, are what really um, got me started. And uh, it was my pursuit of that stuff for years. Uh, at some point, I just started smoking, and I still I still deal in all that. I'm I'm sort of a paper guy first, and a cigar guy second. But um, it's uh, there's a lot of history there, and you know when we were designing all of the idea with the cocktail collection is that the artwork that goes along with the five different cocktails and cigars is all specific to the period of of the cocktails, right? So Negroni is very 1930s uh, European Art Deco, uh, etc. <laughs> And um, it was really fun, to, you know, on this collection in particular, to be able to play more on the cocktail side of things and just the cigar tobacco advertising side of things. I've got to add, Darren, I, I absolutely love the artwork that you come up with for all of your cigars. I think it, it definitely stands out as a brand and it just you evokes know, so many I, sort of I, memories, I, personal memories or collective memories. It, it's uh, your artwork stands out. So uh, yeah, keep it up. And I'm fairly certain that the woman is Malaysian that did the, uh, the just the Negroni oh, one. Oh, okay. Oh, fantastic. And if I could mention one other thing, Reinhardt, you, um, you talked about what music you would pair with your cigar. And uh, being 65 years old, I kind of started to leave music behind a little bit. And I'm going more towards books. And that's what I find... <laughs> <laughs> that's what I find really makes it happen for me when I'm having a drink and a cigar, if I can just be immersed in a really good book, rather than I find music almost interruptive. Good point. Very good point. I, I love reading and having a cigar. It just feels like you totally sink down into yourself. And I totally agree. I'm, I'm a mad reader and there's all sorts going on. Uh, in my Kindle, wherever I may be, and uh, I cherish that power to be able to sit quietly and read and have a cigar. It's just utterly bliss. I totally agree with you. That's interesting you would say that, Valerie. I, 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 I Just when you were talking about that, I was thinking that when I'm just not really doing anything, I'll put on music and it's just whatever the mood is, anywhere from from you know jazz to Viking death metal, just depending on what the mood is. But when I'm smoking a cigar, I'm usually listening to an audiobook. And when I'm smoking a pipe, I'm usually reading a, like an HP Lovecraft book. I didn't notice that until you just said that. That's interesting. <laughs> so I have one question. Like, That's why I'm here. <laughs> one question like being from the F&B industry. So a Negroni, because we're smoking cigars, Negronis. Uh, here in Hong Kong, it's 11 p.m., and it was usually a pre-dinner drink. Yeah. As I said, we're here at 11 o'clock after dinner. We are still enjoying it. Do you consider now the Negroni to be a cocktail rather than a pre-dinner drink? I think that the, the, the category of pre-dinner yeah. is, is just to um, further specify the overall term cocktail and, and make it suitable for particular applications. Um, you know, some people, if you hand them a Negroni as, an, as a pre-dinner drink, you uh -huh. will just knock them right out of their shoes because if they haven't eaten yet and you serve them a Negroni, that might feel that... You having it for breakfast now, right? I mean, the US <laughs> is matching, right? perfect. Yeah. Well, everybody's palate and, and perception of alcohol is different. So if, if Negroni for breakfast is, uh, is something that you could have and, and stand, perfect. <laughs> It's always pre-dinner somewhere. <laughs> um, so in general, it's pre-dinner, pre-day. You know, the, the whole notion of um, uh, Negroni being um, a pre-dinner drink is that, in general, bitter components and, and herbaceous notes were, were considered to help your digestion. Thus, they were being served as aperitifs to, to open the, the palate and to help your body with the digestion of the food that will come later on. But... Again, I, I guess it truly comes down to personal, prefer, personal preference and whether you can stand up before dinner or not. The Negroni is a perfect all day, every day 
cocktail that's very versatile. I've got a question for Gino. Gino, being uh, um, in, in the uh, Italian region of the world, is it, is it considered a crime to order a Negroni uh, after dinner? Or is there strict rules in Italy about what you can do? <laughs> not at all. Italy is not the country for rules. Come on. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you for, for setting up this because it's really nice to, to see, as, as, as Nick says, uh, faces that you don't see for a long time. And I would like to suggest you, if possible, to do others with other drinks, with other cocktails, because it's always for me that I'm not a very uh, strong drinker of cocktails. I mean, heavy drinker of cocktails. It would be interesting to hear all the different cocktails going on. I just drink two things in my life most of the times. The one is, is a Negroni or a Negroni Sbagliato, that we, the wrong Negroni, that is a bit more sweeter. And then the, and then the gin tonics. This is the only two things I drink. So if you do something on cocktails, it would be interesting for everybody. Coming back to your question, yes, uh, there is, uh, I've seen drinking Negroni before, after three o'clock, six o'clock, every time. And there is not really a, a reason when to really drink the Negroni. I mean, that's in my circle of friends. I don't say it's a rule in Italy, but in my circle of friends, uh, whenever they, they, we go for something, uh, I listen, let's have a Negroni. So yes, it's something that we have all the time. So definitely, <laughs> maybe next anytime time is good. Way, uh... So maybe a breakfast, bacon and eggs with, with Negroni would, would work well, why not? <laughs> Maybe the next, uh, the next uh, thing that we do is uh, espresso martinis or uh, Sazeracs with Darren taking the lead and uh, he can lead us through the, uh, the next uh, cocktail collection. I think that might be plans for uh, later in the year. Uh, Nakasan, did you put your hand up? Sorry. Yes. I used to be a bartender at the Intercontinental Hotel almost 30 years before. So I received many questions. Almost the same question from my customer. Oh, somebody could ask for Rocky, so Rocky, great. The answer is original Negroni is Americano. Americano is a company under Vermont, 50-50, and soda water splash. It's mm -hmm. a But now, Negroni recipe was changed. Original Negroni is a equal volume gin company and Vermont. But now it's a 50% gin and 25% 25% company and women. If you want to drink Negroni as pre-dinner cocktail, you have to more company, less gin and uh, red vermouth. If you want to drink after dinner, you have right. to more right. gin and more vermouth, less right. company, it's answer. Yeah. Thank you, we'll have to try that. That's that's have to be tried. Eh? We have to try it, Naka. Yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, it was a pleasure having you tonight. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. We are keeping going, drinking Oriental cigar gin with ice cube or without ice cube with a big ice cube eh? or without and keep smoking keep drinking keep smoking enjoy life thank you ciao thank guys you. thank you for joining us please Bertie, next time Bertie in hong kong you get we'll see you in hong kong <laughs> it's a deal we'll be there sammy so take care thank you <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Uh, fantastic, guys. I know now, Nick, do you, uh, you've had a Negroni, mate, but are you all right to drive? I, I heard a, a little bird told me you've got to go pick up your daughters. I hope you don't get... Yeah, well, up. I'm going on the school run now, so I'm having to, uh, I, shall, I shall have a quick splash of water and, and, um, and, and a glass of water and then go and pretend I'm a responsible parent. Which you are. We're going we're to be watching a playback of this in court. <laughs> he was there drinking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's terrible. Listen, Sammy, are you, is this going to be available for people to watch um, afterwards? Because I think it's been a brilliant set. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, I put it live on Facebook, but I'm an amateur compared to Reinhard, who's uh, in a car on the way to the train station at the moment. But um, I, I, I'm not technically savvy enough to uh, to record it, which uh, it, it's a shame I didn't record it. But but at the um, same no time, worries. I'm um, to you, uh, as a lawyer, no evidence is live. good. <laughs> Otherwise, it's uh, otherwise it's all gone. So um, 
maybe a, a impetus for next time for, every, for more people to jump on so that I'd miss any of this insightful discussion about cocktails and cigars and cigars in general. Right um, usually you can, you can watch the session on Facebook and you could also download the video afterwards. So it will definitely oh, be, be there for people to watch. Thank you, Reinhard. And please, just before people do log off, uh, you're welcome to stay. I've, I've got a third of my Negroni still to go, but I just really like to thank Reinhard uh, for being a partner with this. Darren, Nick as well, uh, you made the story come to life. I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, you guys really told the story. I had the idea and then I uh, obviously reached out to do some research. So thank you to the three of you. Uh, thank you to the cabinet, KL, who haven't uh, jumped on tonight, but they, um, they hosted me for a tasting session as well. So uh, thanks to them in their absence. But uh, just a, a general thank you to everyone for jumping in. Valerie, you shared it on Facebook and, and Push here in Malaysia. Um, we've had people from Europe, uh, Asia, America, Canada. It's uh, fantastic to see you all. So thank you very much for joining in. Thanks thank for the wonderful initiative, Sam. This thank has you, been Sam. a great, great. session. Be and great. I, I think anybody who missed it really missed out on a chance to learn about the history and the future, where we're going with cigars and cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the chance, Sam. Love your work. Thanks to all of you. Lovely to see you. God bless you all. Stay safe wherever you are. Hope things get better. Nick, we will too. Nick, 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 I'm coming to, I'm coming to London at Wembley on uh, July 11. Hope you will be there. Right, let's do it. Let's uh, let's hook up, my friends. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. All right. Thanks, guys. Valerie, you've got quite a just. Uh, some people can log off, which is fair enough. But just quickly, you've got quite a collection behind you. What what do you normally drink with a cigar? Um, it varies. Now, most of my cigar smoking time is spent assessing a cigar, mm -hmm. in which case it is just water that I've let sit overnight. Um, because I don't, I don't like any other influences with my cigar. Um, but I'm, I'm a Canadian whiskey fan, uh, rightfully so, being in Canada, right? Because I have found that Canadian whiskeys, they have sweetness and spiciness. So they go very, very well with cigars. Now you have to shop around a little bit. Um, but you have to shop around with anything. And there's a lot of Canadian whiskeys that are actually shipped to the United States and repackaged under different names. Like for instance, Whistle Pig, if you look at the back label, it's a product of Canada. And I, I don't think everybody realizes that. Um, so, you know, we ship it down, like the Canadian producers ship it down to the States, they repackage it and then ship it back to Canada at an incredible markup, like way more than we'd spend on Canadian whiskey. But, you know, people buy it and that's fine. If they love it, that's great. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I have loved doing now, I have to do this on a very specific day because by the end of it, I am 100% I am gone. Let me, excuse me for just a moment. I got to turn off a, a beeper. Sure. I'm interested to know what she's been drinking that uh, <laughs> puts her on her back and uh, finishes her off for the day. That's, <laughs> that's the dinner in the background in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things I love doing is taking a cigar and a cigar that's, we, you know, the most important consideration when you smoke a cigar is the amount of time you have to smoke it, right? A, a lot of people forget that. If you've got 45 minutes, pick the cigar that's right for that time. So what I'll do is I'll pick like a giant cigar, something that's going to take me an hour or two hours. And I like pairing it with a variety of beverages and making sure I test it third by third by third with three third by third by third um, different beverages. Now, you're, can I swear on this? You're going to be shit faced by the end of it. Okay. But it's a really fantastic journey. It's it is fascinating what happens third to third to third. And well, I have done Valerie, it with- I'll interrupt just for a minute. I, I want to know, do you get past chapter one of the book doing this process or <laughs> do you finish the book and- Oh yeah, a fantastic book. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> it you know, it, what I love about that exercise is it's part discipline because you've got to be taking your notes because- if you have a pen in your hand and any kind of piece of paper, I don't care what it is, 
that helps you stay focused. Okay. I'm here to do a job. What is that job? My job, in fairness to, you know, spending in Canada, the average cigar is $20, $25, like premium handmade cigar. So I've got, you know, $25 worth of smoke, and I've got probably at least $50 worth of alcohol. I've got to be fair to these, like, and I'm talking just drams, like just, you know, shots of each. I've got to be fair to these things because I don't like wasting my money. I, I'm not poor, I am frugal, and I'm, I pay attention. So I take my notes, and, you know, I, I on, on my unread blog, <laughs> because I, I'm not good at that, I just, I'm not. Um, I have done things where I have compared, like, a rum and a bourbon and a Canadian whiskey or a scotch, you know, whatever. The, the transitions that take place, if, if you try it just once on a Sunday when you don't have to drive and you don't have to go anywhere, if you try it just once, the revelations are astounding. And I've got to give Darren credit because I tried it with one of his principal cigars and wow, it was absolutely mind blowing. This is where it helps you understand how the, the cigar is developing and at which point the cigar works with which beverage it's it's a little involved it's very nerdy but i highly recommend it because it's tons of fun just you know do it at the right time of day do you do you stay on a particular you know do you stay with whiskey the whole way through so all the drams you're tasting a whiskey and then bourbon and then rum or do you mix it up completely i mix it up completely now if i wasn't a w set l3 who has tasted over 5,000 different wines, whiskey, spirits, that could be a real challenge. And I'm not saying this to brag, I'm saying it because it's true. I'm practiced enough to be able to isolate them. I can isolate the cigar aromas, I can isolate the beverages, and I can, I can transition. I'm not, I'm not sure I could have done that before I got my you know cigar and spirits training practice but now I can and that's for me that's a beautiful place to be because it's uh it's a real eye-opener and you know I I agree 100% with everybody that I heard on this panel um drink what you like eat what you like smoke what you like but know why you like it take your notes do you know do do you know, combine it so that it's a research and a fun project. Yeah, absolutely. A lovely point, Valerie. I think uh, for most of us amateurs, though, I think, uh, yeah, we wouldn't be, I'd, I'd probably, as an amateur, be pairing sort of at least keep it in the, the same category. So whiskeys or rums, because, yeah, I, I think uh, mixing it up too much would be just a sensory overload for my palate. But uh, no, lovely thoughts, Valerie. Something I'll... Uh, have to put down on the to-do list. <laughs> if if I gonna... could add one more thing, yeah, of course. make sure that you have a flavor wheel like Cigar Sense, the Cigar Sense flavor wheel, because again, this keeps you focused. You're looking at this, you're watching the wheel. Sometimes, you know, an aroma will hit you and, oh man, I can't name it. And, and so I'll just glance at the, at the wheel and I'll say, okay, was it it was sweet. So, okay, so if it was sweet, was it like brown sugar sweet? Was it gingerbread sweet? Was it honey sweet? And that helps me identify it and mark it down as my tasting note. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've done some uh, reviews for Franca as well at Cigar Sense and she's got a fantastic platform. But yeah, I agree. By having that flavor wheel in front of you, it does help jog the memory because there's so many times where I've, I've had a cigar and it's, it's hard sometimes to put your finger on exactly what it is. I mean, I try, personally, I try and associate the flavor with a particular food you know and, and very general is it is it spicy um is it sweet um but then you know a flavor wheel can take you to that next level of going okay what sort of spice is it what sort of sweetness is it um yeah so a flavor wheel like that and you know if, if you don't have a flavor wheel you can grab one online and uh, download it but it's it's a fantastic resource to uh, jog your memory and one of the, I've been an analyst for Cigar Sense since 2015, and one of the best lessons that Franca ever taught me was that aromas never show up alone. And, and once you understand that, you, you start to, you know, kind of train your brain to say, okay, if it's not alone, what's its, what is it closest to? You don't have to be 100% accurate, but try to be close. 
Absolutely. It's it's interesting because a lot of people uh, that are, you know, even, even seasoned cigar smokers, but a lot of newbies sort of come up and they say, oh, how do you get this flavor and things like that? And, and so a lot of it is down to practice and, you know, looking at a flavor wheel to identify the flavors. But other times I tell people, look, it's, it's just what popped in my head when I was smoking it at the time. And maybe that goes back to that experience thing that Reinhard was mentioning that, you know, it's, it might be sweet for me, but I've got a sweet drink. I've just had a, had just had dessert or something like that. So that flavor influences what I've been having. And <clears throat> the, the main thing I think for a lot of newcomers to cigars is that you don't have to analyze a cigar at the, at the level that you might read about in Cigar Journal or Cigar Aficionado or on Cigar Sense. It's all about, you know, identify what you like, whether it's spicy, whether it's sweet. And oftentimes that, that's good enough. But if you do want to go to that next level, the, the flavor wheel definitely helps. Yeah, thanks, Valerie. Valerie, I have a couple of questions for you. I, you know, the, one is, I, you know, it seems, at least to me from my, my experience with whiskey, that Canadian whiskey is sort of looked down upon as not really a whiskey and things to people like, oh, that's... That's the, I mean, it's, you know, Crown Royal and Fireball. How, what, what do you do to over, <laughs> yeah. But what do you do to overcome and, and, and introduce people into the things like Whiskey, Whistle Pig and things like that? And uh, I'm just fascinated. What, what, what do you actually do? This is the first time I, I've, I, I've met you and talked to you. you I mean, it's fascinating. I, I tell, tell you about yourself and what, what you do with your experience because it seems incredible. It's like what you're saying with the uh, with the flavor wheels and things. Is, of course, they have the whiskey flavor wheels. They're the same thing. Where you know, e e even with my experiences, I'll still either get weird stares walking around grocery stores, smelling things, just to to to, to, kind, of <laughs> to kind of get the, get the thing go. But then still, even me, I'll sit down with a with the whiskey flavor wheel or cigar flavor wheel and start from the big, and then narrow it down to uh, instant. I mean, just. Just yesterday, I, I made a comment. Someone was talking about uh, Glen Morangy Nectar Door, and they said it, it, it's an alcoholic pastry shop. And they thought that was amusing and witty. I'm like, that's just the only thing that comes to my mind. So, what, what do you, you know, what do you do, and then what do you do to convince people that Canadian whiskey isn't just Crown Royal and Fireball? <laughs> um, again, I'm I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. Uh, people have been drinking Canadian whiskey and they don't realize they're drinking Canadian whiskey. They have to read the back label. It's a product of Canada. And there's a lot of those whiskeys in the States. Uh, we ship train loads. And when I say we, I mean Canada. We ship train loads of Canadian whiskey to, you know, the Indiana plant. We ship it, you know, everywhere to be repackaged and sold as, as something great. Um, so when it comes to Canadian whiskey, I, you know, um, we... The, the Canadian whiskey market really kind of um, had its renaissance in af just after World War I because of prohibition. So there wasn't that much available to the states and it was run along like the, the eastern border from the Maritimes down to New York, just like rum did. I mean, people from the states traveled down to Cuba. Uh, it was, you know, because it wasn't closed off at that time. And so rum kind of gained uh, a little bit of... Um, a notoriety in the spirits business, and that's fine. But getting back to Canadian whiskey, I think it is the number one uh, beverage to pair with cigars because of its flavor profiles. Now, keep in mind, Canada has weird rules. We call every single Canadian whiskey rye, even though it's made with wheat or corn. There's very few uh, Canadian whiskeys that are 100% rye, Alberta Premium being one of them. Um, be, rye is very, very hard to work with. I've known a producer who tried to make rye and three times it turned to concrete before he got it figured out. It's tough. It's, rye is very, very tough to work with. It'll harden on you very, very quickly. So you have to know your way around the rye grain. Um, the other thing with rye, there's provinces that, you know, we're, we're just absolutely the food belt of the world. Um, being in the prairie provinces of Canada. Um, but corn is very cheap. So, you know, corn is typically the grain that's used for spirits because it's not expensive. Wheat is a little bit easier to work with than rye. It's still glutinous, but it, it, it doesn't harden like, um, like rye does through the distilling process. So um, I was at um, Big Smoke in um, Vegas 
and Manuel Casada was there and, and he was, you know, smoking his cigars. And I could tell by the look of his, on his face that he was shocked at how well Canadian whiskeys went with cigars. And again, I related to the, to the, to the sweetness that's inherent to Canadian whiskey and the spiciness that's inherent to, you know, the rye, even if the rye is a smaller component of the blend. So that answers one question. The second question is, how did I get here so that I can speak intelligently on the products? That took work. I'm glad to say that I'm, you know, a level three sommelier. While I was taking, and I'm just gonna pull this out, while I was taking my level three sommelier, they recommend level three wines and spirits. Ah, oh, shoot, that fell. Um, they recommended we use this nosing aroma kit. There's 50, 54 aromas for wine in this kit. And it's got everything you'd ever need, La Ne du Vin. So you practice with this, but this is like almost a thousand dollar touch once you, you know, get it delivered. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you right now that these aromas are all things that you would find in your pantry. And if you're not prepared to go to your pantry and pull out your molasses and smell it every day, if you're not prepared to go into your pantry and pull out two different kinds of honey, Manuka honey, regular honey, if you're not prepared to go into your pantry and smell different kinds of vanilla, whether it's Madagascar vanilla, vanilla bean, or regular vanilla, don't bother spending your money on a nosing kit, whether it's wine, whiskey, cigars, whatever, because your pantry has everything you need to get you started on the olfactory journey, then it's up to you. You gotta take some notes so that you've got your olfactory vocabulary so that you don't have to necessarily rely on a wheel to remind you what the aromas and the flavors are. And don't forget, aromas and flavors are very, or aromas and tastes are very different. Taste is your, you know, sweet, salty, bitter, umami, all that stuff, right? Aromas are something else entirely. They're two different things. Fantastic. Thanks, Valerie. <laughs> what else do you have sitting over there you're prepared to smell? You pull that <laughs> on <laughs> real quick. You just, <laughs> Valerie's casually got a, a box of molasses ready to go or a can, you, sorry. Say, or you'd a, be surprised what I've got here. I'm looking around for it right now. I even have an aroma kit for oak and I can't of course I can't find it right now but that is my favorite aroma kit because oak is very very tricky when you're when you're tasting wines or whiskeys you've got to know the difference between vanilla and coconut and you've got like that's why I emphasize the um the vanilla part you really need to know that stuff if you want to be you know really good at what you do or if you really want to take it to the next level of appreciation when it comes to wine whiskey and cigars but yeah I got tons of stuff like behind me this is my little setup because I like using a real background because sometimes I think when I post on Facebook or Twitter I sometimes you know kind of get the reaction oh you don't really have all that stuff yeah actually I do have all this stuff and more and I want to point out for instance like this Cohiba jar here I gotta tell you the story this is really funny I'm visiting my daughter in in Victoria British Columbia and, you know, I was early to, to catch my plane from, from the airport. And I walk into this, basically it was a vape store. I couldn't believe it. They had the two jars. They had the Cohiba and they had these um, Cohiba Distinguished shows. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, are you blank and kidding me? What are, they, what are they doing with these? They don't know what they've got, right? And so I bought one of the, uh, one of the Cohibas. I took it home. I checked it out. And sure enough, it was authentic. And... Um, I said to my daughter, you've got to go back there and you've got to ask them how much they'd want for the jars and the 10 cigars that are left. Because I mean, you know, let's face it, this is 2000, right? Or those, that collection is 2000, $500 Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if I wasn't trained in wine, whiskey and cigars, I would not have known what that was so she was able to you know pick them up and uh and and uh ship them out to me but um you i've i've got such a collection in my little condo here and i'm really proud of it 
And, um, uh, you know, I love collecting swag and Darren, you've given me some of your cigars to smoke and I'm eternally grateful for you. You guys are going to laugh. Um, I knew of Darren from our, our session with him on Smooth Draw Cigar Radio. And then a couple of years later, I'm at the Davidoff Cigar Lounge doing the IPCP, or PCA show now it's called. And I'm sitting there with my buddies and all of a sudden I look out of the corner of my eye and, and I see Darren walking into the Davidoff Lounge. We hadn't met and I went bonkers. I went crazy. Like I leaped off my, my, the seat of my chair and, and I you know planted myself in front of him. And I said, oh my God, you're Darren Chaffee. You're one of the, the you know, world champions of cigar smokers. I'm such a fan. And Andrew Kellner Jr. was behind him, and, and I see I see him who I who I've met before, and, and I said, oh oh hi, um, you're important too. But this is Darren Chaffee. <laughs> I invited Hendrick to come on today because we were talking just before this, but I guess he's busy. But the funny thing is, at that radio show, I always thought you were in the next room. Val was in Canada. She was like the engineer or something. I'm like, <laughs> when am I going to meet the lady in the next room? Why don't you let her come in here? And then I found out it was remote. Yeah, yeah, I was I was a nine hour flight away. <laughs> I, I love trade shows just for that specific fact of meeting, you know, the the, the stars of the industry. Um, mm -hmm. I remember my first trade show. I was at the two thousand seven, uh, not IPCPR but RTDA show. This is going back a while, wow. and I was I was doing some work for the RTD at the time, and the um, one of the the staff there had got me to do some uh, summaries of all of the legislation coming out, you know, so that it could be summarized and sent out to all of the uh, the members. But I remember going to, to Houston and all of a sudden, and I mean, this is even predates, I was only just getting started with Cigar Journal. And at the same time, I, I walk into the IPCPR or RTDA as a, as a sort of part of the team. And all of a sudden in this one room, there's Rocky Patel, there's Jorge Pedron, there's, there's you know, Carlito, all these, all these big names. And I was like, you know, I was only, you know, mid, late 20s at the time. I was going, oh, my God, I've died and gone to heaven. There's all these people in the same room. So, yeah, trade trade shows and uh, events are uh, fantastic for meeting the members of the cigar industry. And the thing that I love about the cigar industry, people always ask me, oh, what do you love about it? And obviously it's the cigars themselves, but I just love the fact that it's such a an industry where people really are passionate about it, they care. And you can walk up to Rocky or Jorge or Carlito and say hello, say good day, and they'll give you the time of day. They they won't fob you off. They'll talk to you, and it, it's just the the most pleasurable industry. I, I'm sure it's similar with whiskey and wine and and other sort of sensory industries, but with cigars especially, that's what brings me back, and and that's why I'm, I love uh, my role with Cigar Journal. It's just uh, the industry is is one where everyone. Uh, just loves what they do. They love talking about cigars. They love talking about different cigars. Uh, and it's just the people, you know, I mean, and that's what made tonight so fantastic as well is just getting everyone together and uh, enjoying a cigar and a, and a groni in this case. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good memories to have and hope, I mean, you know, the, uh, the PCA is going ahead this year. Inter Tobacco was cancelled this year, but hopefully that it all uh, gets up and running again in 2022 around the world and people can travel a little bit more. Yeah, I won't be able to make it to PCA this year. The Canadian US border is still closed and I'm not gonna put up with the uh, with the quarantine that, that's required. Hopefully I can make it to the Rocky Mountain Cigar Fest at the end of August. But again, that's all up in the air, but I agree with you. And the other thing too, is when it comes to, um, you know, learning about, you know, different things with wines, whiskeys and cigars, you know, I've got a couple of editions of Cigar Journal. And I think it is the number one magazine for cigar readers and, and cigar enthusiasts because it, it doesn't give you any fluff. It's all meat. It's all important material. I will, you know, I that's, subscribe yeah, to a few magazines. It's not, uh, it's not golf courses. It's not private yachts. It's, uh, it's, it's all, not you know, girls holding, holding cigars. cigars. Tobacco pretty much all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. But the other that's thing that I love about... Um, cigars, wine and whiskey, like once you get into the education part of it, there, there's so many things to learn, like you learn about climate, you learn about culture, you learn about geography. I, um, I walked into a bookstore and I saw this book, Phylloxera, and I'm thinking, and, and I know what Phylloxera is, and if any of you don't know what Phylloxera is, you should probably learn about it, because it is, it, it devastated French vineyards, but by devastating French vineyards, and I'm not saying this is a positive thing, it's not, but what that did 
was it, it um, created more of an interest and, and a requirement and it was a necessity for people who wanted alcohol. That's what got them into Scotch whiskey was because they didn't have access to their, to their uh, French wines. So Scotch whiskey filled that gap. And if you don't do study, you don't learn things about phylloxera. And I mean, how boring does your life have to be to write an entire book about phylloxera? But it happened. I'm glad it did. It's very interesting. In the States, it's known as the botanist and the vintner. Um, but if, if you're going to read one book in your life, read about phylloxera because it changed the landscape. It, cocktails, that also probably was the result of what happened to the French wine industry. And, you know, we, I, I can't leave this session without mentioning, we don't want this. We don't want any more plain, stupid packaging, right? You're talking to an Australian here, I think we uh, started it all, so apologies. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Uh, we got it in Canada and it's, it's dreadful. So do your part. If you're going to spend an hour on the internet, you know, talking with your friends, take an hour a month and attend either a civic or a state. If you can get into a federal meeting, do everything you can to prevent this kind of thing getting any more of a stronghold throughout the world. This is this is horrible. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Samuel, I just want you to pan your camera around that room you're in, Valerie. What, what the hell do you have in that? What don't you have in that room? <laughs> He's on the toilet. I That's just behind. <laughs> I thought about that, dear, and I thought about it. Honest to God. Um, I, I don't have 75% of the rest of my stuff, right? But, I, you know, I, I like showcasing stuff. Like, who's got a prepare, hate, seek rare? And you know what? I got that champagne in Saskatchewan for $50 a bottle because they didn't know what we had. But I did because I paid the dime and did the time to get educated by Wine and Spirit Education Trust. I mean, you know, I've got a, a magnum here of Sasakaya. I've got, I've got all kinds of fun stuff, right? Um, I always, this guy up here, this is my tribute to celebrating Saskatchewan. And next to it is my Saka swatch. Um, I've, got, I've got Black Adder. I've got a very cool bottle of Black Adder. Um, and I've got Darren cigars because I don't have any Darren paraphernalia. I wish I did. I, I wish I had some principal paraphernalia, but I don't. And I will call it swag for the lack of a, a better term. Um, another book that everybody should read if you're interested in spirits That's is Keep Smoking Spirits. Yeah, yeah, it's a great book. It's now known as Whiskey Island because that title didn't sell, so they learned their lesson. But that's by Andrew Jefford, and Andrew Jefford is a really underappreciated writer. He does amazing stuff, right? Amazing stuff. So yeah, if, you know, if you want to kind of, I've got lots of Ornelia in my wine cellar. Um, I do smoke pipes. I've got, uh, I've got 500 cigars. I've probably got at least 200 bottles of wine. And I would say 10% of them are large format wine. I mean, and Darren has seen my, my little collection of Sautern, um, I, you know, and I've got, I forget what year it is. It's 1940s or 1950s. Uh, Chateau Ikem, which was again something that I just stumbled across. I was I was very lucky to get that. But part of my deal is okay, I'm a gray-haired woman, overweight, and I love cigars and I find it exciting. I find it interesting and exciting. And it's given it's it it breathes life into my existence. And I think there's a lot of 60 plus women who are lonely. They don't have something to, to go to. And I remind them, you can travel alone. You can go to these regions. If you walk into a cigar lounge, you don't have to worry about how you're going to be treated because the behavior is predictable in a cigar lounge. It's not like in a bar lounge where the behavior isn't predictable. In a cigar lounge, it is predictable. Spread your wings, fly a little bit. And, um, I know that there's a, a huge community of 20 year old female cigar smokers that are, you know, are the up and comers. 
And I'm, I'm so glad to see them. And these are not the Instagram girls. These are the people like the girls hockey teams, the Canadian girls hockey team. What did they do when they, when they won their championship a few years ago, they were on the ice. They were smoking a cigar. Now they got beat up real bad for that, but they shouldn't have been because it's not a bad habit. It's a good way to relax and enjoy your time. Absolutely. Well, Valerie, we, I know where I'm staying when I ever visit Canada. <laughs> Have you got a, and you're got more a, than a welcome. Uh, I'll help you uh, drink some of that fabulous uh, alcohol you've got behind you and smoke some of your cigars. No problem. <laughs> you're more than welcome. Well, I'm just yeah. so glad I know next to nothing about wine because God knows I have enough expensive hobbies and habits that I don't need to add another one to the mix. But it's it's crushing because Korea is so far behind the vaccine schedule that. And, and they're doing it like age-based. Right now they're doing 60 to 74. And me being the 52-year-old young buck, I don't even qualify for my first round of anything until the beginning of August. So I'm going to miss the big smoke in Vegas. I'm from Utah, so I always try, try to like coordinate my annual vacation schedule to tell my family, I've only got a week vacation, but they don't know I've already spent a week in Vegas before I go back to Utah. But it, it's... It's amazing that, you know, we, we talk about, like you said, the predictability of lounges and things. Because I would say that there's no strangers in whiskey and no strangers in cigars. And, and that's what I like about, you know, the, the, the club here is not a formal sit down and shut up cigar club, cigar club, like I said. It's two groups of people that have never met each other sit at opposite ends of the lounge. And by the end of the night, you're best friends. You just know that it's a good person that's walking through that door. And I, I love that about the spirits and I love that about cigars. Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, industry to be a part of, whether you're, you know, whether you're just a, a occasional cigar smoker or uh, somebody a bit more regular. That's one of the things that I enjoy is just the meeting people. And one of the things that I often tell people is that, you know, there's that whole stereotype about cigar smokers that they're all, you know, investment bankers or the elite of society. But I mean, I've had cigars with bricklayers, with electricians, school teachers i'm a former school teacher myself and it just it, it, it's a it's a hobby that does attract everyone um and, and it unfortunately does have that stereotype but i think you know that that's definitely changing uh you know as as, as time progresses and, and you you meet a, a wide range of people that you know enjoy a cigar once a week or once a day or once a month and it, it doesn't really matter if you're a cigar smoker and there's someone in the lounge you usually strike up a conversation somehow and uh at the end, yeah, as you said, Jeff, at the end of the night, you leave uh, as best friends. So, uh, yeah, part of, part of the reason for enjoying cigars. <laughs> well, Korea is so isolated that you know, it's 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 a, a very small pool to draw from, and so I, I don't still don't have a lot of experience with the world at large. I mean, I mean, Valerie's probably the only person that's qualified to answer this, but you still got a lot of the. Do you really smoke that as a woman? Do you really drink that? I mean, do you get that and just lay into people or do you just uh, kind of play dumb or how, how do you handle those kind of situations? Well, um, if you want to know from my heart, I'm hurt. I'm hurt that they say those things. I really am. Um, I've had women my age um, obviously not like me and their comments are, oh, you're just trying to keep up with the boys. And that's not what it is at all. It's, it's, it, it came from my love of aromas. And I started loving aroma when I was eight years old, when I got my first Kittle Cologne doll. Um, and she was a violet aroma. And I became fascinated with violets because of her. And as a result, you know, when I was able to work in a, at a fragrance counter, and this is many, many years ago when you only had so many fragrances, it was fascinating seeing everything that was happening. And that led me to get educated on perfumes and fragrances. And um, I was always a tequila girl. I, uh, you know, until I was 40, basically alcohol was just, you know, to drink and, you know, black out with. But once I hit 40 and once I hit my, my you know, once, <laughs> once I was able to take once W set was able to expand their reach and get into other centers, once I started taking those classes, I became less of a drinker and more of a, of a thinker. 
to be honest. And I started with wine, uh, being, you know, a single female traveler, wine wasn't always my best option because once you open a bottle of wine, chances are I have to drink it. I'm not complaining. I like drinking bottles of wine at a time, but it's better to go to a whiskey or a spirit because you can recap it and it lasts for a lot longer than a bottle of wine does. And um, I always love smoking. I smoke cigarettes and, and I don't anymore. I'm, I'm surprised to myself. I haven't had a cigarette in a year because I always love cigarettes. I don't love cigarettes anymore. I've had enough really good premium cigars to know that cigarettes are not good. They're, they're not a good tobacco. Um, premium, handmade premium cigars are, are so much better to enjoy. And I'm more, you know, I don't need that quick hit of nicotine anymore. I'd rather wait and really enjoy my cigar experience. Um, but it was actually through whiskey that I got into um, cigars. Well, that's kind of not true because I was a Scandinavian tobacco rep for two years. I was a Saskatchewan rep. And what the, the one, my one big takeaway from Scandinavian was I learned what I liked about handmade premium cigars. It wasn't until I tasted an MX2 that I realized that's the cigar for me. Not, not this other stuff that people typically give to women, like the, like the flavored cigars, the moon trance or whatever the heck that thing was called. But that wasn't for me, the MX2 was for me. And you've got to find that. And that's a personal journey, but you know, be alert, be aware of everything else that's going on so that, so that you know what's you when you find it. And like I say, that CAOMX2 was, a, was um, a pivotal moment for me. And that's when I really expanded. And I was luck lucky enough to be able to work at a booth at an IPCPR 2015. That's where I met the Smooth Jaws guys. And that's where I met Franca from Cigar Sense. And, and then things were, I, I mean, I'm at the best stage of my life. I would never turn the clock back ever because nothing has compared to what has happened to me since I hit my 40s, my 50s, and my 60s. It's just, cigars are just so beautiful and they're so amazing and they're so challenging because, you know, with a wine or a whiskey, typically you pick up an aroma and, and you're not sure what it is, but you can go back to that glass and, you know, chances are it's still in the glass and you can name it. Not so with cigars. With cigars, you've got to be on it. You've got to be focused and paying attention if you're doing a cigar assessment because those aromas are fleeting and they might not come back. And you've missed a chance to give yourself a pat on the back that that was garlic. I can't believe I just smelled garlic on a particular, it happened once, but I'll never forget that moment because I'd never smelled garlic on a cigar before. Um, the other beauty of getting educated Wine Spirit Education Trust or whichever program you choose to use when you sit down in a lounge, people will challenge you if they know that you've got the education and they will say, what would you pair with my cigar? Well, give me one of your cigars and maybe I can tell you. And, and this actually happened at Monte Cristo in Las Vegas. And so I'm smoking this guy's cigar. And I said to him, I says, I'm just kind of wondering how you got the banana in your cigar. There's no banana in my cigar. And you know, two puffs later, oh my God, I just got the banana. And I'm thinking, and I've got you <laughs> because yes, there was banana, but you didn't want to believe me. And now you should. OK, um, so that's what I'm faced with. There's a lot of people that don't believe it. Um, they think it's smoke and mirrors. They think it's hocus pocus. No, there is science. There is education. I've done I've done the time. I paid the dime and it's real. And if if you want to be on my, you know, in my reality, go ahead. If you don't walk away from me and I can walk away from you, but let's stay friends. But man, when I meet people like you guys, like Darren, who really get it, I love you so much. Uh, thanks, Marilee. I really appreciate your input. And it's interesting you mentioned about the MX2, because I think uh, just generally with female smokers, it's always, oh, have, a, have a small cigar or have a flavored cigar. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not giving uh, female smokers the respect they deserve to be able to come up with their own decisions. Um, on that note, it's, it's approaching midnight here in Kuala Lumpur and uh, I've had two Negronis and starting to feel it. So I might check out soon, but uh, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to have you all on uh, the show that this evening. It's been uh, really good and, and listening to you, Valerie, and your experience has been really enlightening. I'm glad, so glad you joined us. 
Um, and Joey, first time interacting with you, mate, but um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I see plenty of photos with you and Carlito at uh, some events and things. So uh, good on you, mate, keep it up. And and Darren, uh, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, it's uh, probably what, 11, 10 a.m. there. So you're due for another Negroni. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Sam. This was really great. Look forward to the no, next no, no. one. Fantastic. We'll, we'll see you soon. Yeah, this has been yeah, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Let's all hope that uh, the world sorts itself out and we can uh, all catch up in real life soon. Ciao, thank Sam. You, yeah. Gino, Ciao, Thank you so much, Sam. Ciao to everybody. Thank you. Have a great night. Cheers. Ciao. 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 Ciao.